All right, thanks everybody. I'm gonna go ahead and start. My name is Greg Madden. I am the, uh, the CIO at UCAR and NCAR. So NCAR is the National Center for Atmospheric Research. UCAR is the University Corporation for Atmospheric Research, uh, which operates uh, NCAR. With me today are Jennifer Phillips, our library director, and Matt Marinick, the, uh, the assistant or deputy director, assistant director, whatever that is. And you will notice that we put our ORCID IDs on the slide just because we felt like, you know, you really ought to do that. Uh, so uh, we're going to give you a little bit of organizational background about UCAR and NCAR, and then our immediate motivation for what we're doing uh, over the next five and a half months. Uh, and then uh, Matt and Jennifer will come in and, and give you all the interesting pedagogical uh, stuff that's associated with this. Uh, so you, NCAR and UCAR. NCAR is the Federally Funded Research and Development Center. It's the National Center for Atmospheric Research up in Boulder. Uh, so I think all three of us just drove down today. Uh, UCAR is an operating entity and, and basically the only thing it operates is NCAR. So they, these two organizations are tied at the hip, have been for 60 years. Uh, we have a cooperative agreement with NSF uh, and so that's how that works. We do have about 120 uh, slightly more member colleges and universities or a .edu for our email addresses. Uh, as it turns out, we're not particularly educational, we're not really government, we're not really a bunch of things. So we're, we're similar to a lot, we're a little bit like um, a tiny bit of your university administration uh, coupled with your VPR's office and some institutes. So th that's probably the easiest way to look at it. Uh, we have a lot of facilities. We've got a supercomputing center uh, up in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Uh, we do community coordination and we do obviously atmospheric research. Uh, so our immediate motivation, so Matt's gonna talk more about the sort of motivations around PIS and ORCIDs and, and that sort of thing, but our immediate motivation is that we got a UCAR President Strategic Initiative Fund grant to improve the adoption of ORCIDs across NCAR and UCAR, uh, also to uh, complete some initial integrations of ORCIDs into our systems, uh, to help with NCAR's Research Impacts Initiative. So right now when the NSF asks us, you know, show, show your work, it's very difficult, so it takes a long time and a lot of effort to pull everything together and sort of really kind of show where their money is going. So we have a research impacts initiative to improve that, and then really we're trying to sort of drive towards what I call a virtuous cycle of integrations. Uh, and then, so this is the slide for this. The nice thing about being the CIO is I can be wildly overly ambitious and then um, back it off when it turns out to be unrealistic. So. These are some of the integrations we have either in progress or planned for ORCIDs. So on the left-hand side first is sort of our research products. Uh, Open Sky is uh, our, it's our internal database of organizationally affiliated research output. So we have ORCIDs in there already. Uh, we are uh, gonna use ORCIDs as our authentication system for a variety of our data products so that we know who's accessing our data. So we, they, we've got the Geoscience Data Exchange, our Research Data Archive, uh, Climate Data Gateway, those three different data products, and we're trying to make sure we know who's using those. Uh, our EOL Field Data Archive, EOL is the Earth, Earth Observing Lab, uh, and we're including uh, ORCIDs in our metadata records there, also in a metadata records for the DASH search. What does DASH stand for again? It's a Digital Asset Services Hub. It's our consolidated search for all products across the organization. Yeah, thank you. Then more on the IT side, and this is uh, like I'm, I'm enterprise IT, so this is where I, I kind of come in here, uh, is we're trying to get this in, spread throughout all of our enterprise systems so that from the, sort of that operational level, again, UCAR is the operating entity, that we can really be confident we can meet NSF's cooperative agreement and really tell it where its money is going, where all of our funders' money is going. NSF's not our only funder. So we really want to be able to uh, really show the impact of, of those funding. So uh, some of the things we're gonna do is get, it, uh, get the ORCIDs into our, our Mule platform, which is a, just an integrations platform that makes it uh, sort of easier to integrate across multiple systems. Uh, we're gonna get it into our, our research administration system. We have Kuali Research, so we wanna make sure it's in there so that we understand you know, who's applying for grants based on their ORCID and then we can report out based on that. Uh, we're gonna get it into our organizational financial system. We have Workday Financials, or well, we will in about a year, uh, assuming all goes well. Uh, and so we want to integrate from that research administration system into our financial system so we get better financial reporting on, on all of the grants. Uh, we're going to get it into our HR system so that we can tie our researchers to their ORCIDs internally within, within, our, within what we're doing uh, for HR. 
get into our research information management system. We're about three months away from, well, probably less than that from having it selected. We don't actually have a tool right now. That's why it takes us so long to do our research reporting right now. Uh, and then we're going to also get it tied into our identity governance and directory services. So really, we're trying to just spread the ORCID across everywhere it can be spread so that we can tie all of our information better together and just get better reporting much faster. So the problem is now when we get asked to do these things, like report on, our, uh, on where the funding is going, it can take weeks of a bunch of people to pull all that data together from multiple different sources. We're really trying to get that down to hours, go into a system, click a button, all the graphs and money comes up, and you're done. So we're really trying to go from weeks of multiple people to hours of a couple of people so that we can really improve our reporting there. Uh, so that's what I've got, and now over to Matt. All right, thanks, Greg. So the, the theme of the, the talk for the, kind of the rest of it, and uh, Greg kind of kicked us off, is trying to move from the idea of assigning persistent identifiers to doing things with them. And so if you, you know, if you think about the slides Greg already showed, you know, on the first slide, our orchids were there. That's sort of a label, right? That, that doesn't do anything for you if that's all you have. But if we can use orchids in the sense that Greg said, uh, to connect these systems, then we can do something with them. So that's kind of the theme, and, and I have a few slides on each of those themes, uh, and we'll talk about a few cases. So I just pulled, pulled this up to kind of emphasize that point that, um, first of all, to step back, the persistent identifiers we're talking about here are not, again, sort of something you might have in an internal HR system, but it's the idea of an identifier that can be used to persistently identify something on the web. Um, and as the second part of this quote says, uh, there's some actionable aspect to it, right? So it resolves to a, a page where that asset is, if it's a publication or a data set, or in the case of a person who's you know, obviously not a digital entity, there's information about that person. So that's the kind of core idea of the persistent identifier versus some generic identifier that you might have in any system, is that it's web-based uh, and there's some actionable aspect to it. And so that's what we want to get to um, uh, in this talk and kind of interested in hearing your thoughts as well on what we, what we might use with identifiers or what you've done uh, with identifiers. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the assigning part first, just to kind of set the stage and the landscape. Uh, so we've been assigning DOIs um, uh, through uh, the data site organization uh, since 2012, and we have also been assigning ARCs, which are uh, archival resource keys, another type of persistent identifier uh, since about the same time. And those are, uh, it's a service supported by the California Digital Library. Uh, and you can see the sort of breakdown of asset types here, just to give you an idea of what we're using these for. Um, so DOIs, we're really using those for, you know, sort of citable objects, kind of to, to uh, create a persistent citation for data sets, uh, texts of various kinds, software, and, you know, to the folks who were in the previous session, 41 is a dramatic undercount of the amount of software produced by our organization, but um, if you were in the last session, uh, there's sometimes challenges in getting a good grasp on that topic. Um, the reason we use uh, ARCs uh, in addition to DOIs is that in our open access repository, which is called OpenSky that Greg mentioned earlier, uh, many of the things we collect in there are um, published articles, that's the top item there, um, that themselves have DOIs created by the publishers. So we didn't want to assign a second DOI to sort of confuse that situation. So we use ARCs as a different type of identifier for our own resolution of our own uh, persistent objects. Uh, and then, you know, various uh, other types of assets going on down. I'll give a, a quick uh, sort of promotional shout. If you, if you want pictures of clouds, we have lots of pictures of clouds in our uh, open sky repository. Uh, so uh, please take a look at that. Um, i call out one more example here. Uh, since uh, we're just getting this project kicked off, and I know Martin's right here. He's funded our project. Um, so we have a new research coordination network funded by the FAIR OS project. Uh, it's focused on persistent identifiers for facilities and instruments. And I think I showed briefly on the last slide uh, physical object there on the left, the fourth one. Um, so we have assigned uh, uh, about 25 DOIs to um, things like uh, just shown here. This is a set of uh, integrated surface flux measurement towers uh, and tools that our, one of our uh, NCAR labs provides. And we've also assigned a DOI to some of our aircraft. And in line with Greg, what Greg said earlier, we're trying to use these DOIs to facilitate persistent um, kind of citation to them or you know, metrics of usage. Um, attribution of usage, uh, things like that. So if you're interested in this topic, uh, please feel free to come and talk with me. I'd be interested uh, to talk more about this. We're uh, just getting this project kicked off uh, now and we're digging in a lot more in the next few years. So if you're interested in facilities and instruments, even kind of campus level facilities, we have colleagues at the University of Colorado and Florida State also in this project. 
Uh, so we're happy to talk to you about that. Um, there's also externally generated uh, um, identifiers, and this is a couple of examples that are more prominent for us. Um, Greg already mentioned ORCIDs. Uh, we're still trying to get a grasp on um, who has ORCIDs within our organization and how, how uh, kind of full their profiles are. Um, we're, these are the numbers so far, and um, our organization as a whole is about 1,200 people. About half of that is research staff, so we think we're actually doing pretty good in terms of the numbers. We're just kind of still trying to suss out exactly what those are. Um, we're also interested in the research organization registry ID IDs or ROARs. Um, we know UCAR and NCAR both have ROARs. Some of our subunits have ROARs. Um, we're not quite sure how they get created because some of them don't. Uh, so organizational um, uh, ID identification can be somewhat tricky. You know, what is, what is somebody's affiliation? Are they UCAR? Are they NCAR? This is an internal debate we have far too often. Um, but these are things that we sort of have less control over, put it that way. We do, we do not create these identifiers ourselves. So that's the landscape of what's been assigned or what's been created, and now we're gonna talk about using persistent identifiers, and again, that's the kind of theme we're trying to get to is from just assigning them to using them. And again, I like this uh, to sort of emphasize that point that the benefit from the use of persistent identifiers, there needs to be a clear case about the benefits of taking time to, to actually use them, right, to, for scholars to use them. So um, that's what we're trying to do with a couple of these cases in addition to the ORCID project what Greg mentioned is um, doing things with them to incentivize people to create them and to use them more consistently. And this is kind of the theme, this is you know, just sort of a cartoon, there's nothing kind of logical about this, but right, the idea is that there's lots of persistent identifiers for lots of things. Um, they, these things are often related, right? the people create the data, the people use the tools, the people create the services or use the services, publications derive from the data, use the software, use the instruments, uh, and we think there's a lot of potential to uh, using these identifiers and connecting them more, so that's gonna be a little bit of what we talk about in later slides. Um, and there's a lot of interest externally, you know, from data site, which pro provides DOIs and other organizations to creating a, a PID graph, quote unquote, uh, which would kind of connect these in a more formal sense. So the two cases we're gonna talk through uh, for the rest of the talk is um, linking scientific papers to underlying data, software, and other resources to enable discovery, and gathering impact, me impact metrics uh, to assess impact and identify contributions to scientific work. So in the first case, linking scientific papers, uh, this was a, a long-running project for us. Um, uh, can we collect and display linkages between specifically papers and data sets, but then it extended to other kinds of resources such as software and instruments? How to make this information usable and understandable? How to do this in a tractable way? That, that means automated as much as possible without maintenance or with minimal maintenance. And so the workflow that we've uh, come up with um, with our software engineers in the library, which is now operational, is that when we collect open access copies of articles produced by NCAR and UCAR staff, um, we have a PDF parsing process that looks through them, it looks for all DOIs, and then we're able to use the metadata associated with those DOIs to tell what those DOIs are. Are they to articles, are they to data, are they to software, are those DOIs to instruments? Um, and then we can kind of use that metadata to determine what they are and insert that back into our own uh, systems and then display uh, the related links. And we like, uh, we like this process because uh, services such as Web of Science or other citation services often don't look at the full text, and so we know that they're missing things. And so we, we feel this is more complete. So this is just a screenshot of the kind of outcome of that. Uh, this is a service we've added to our institutional repository. Um, this is a landing page for an article, and on the left, uh, somewhat small text, but there's uh, supporting data sets and supporting software, uh, and that, that links directly to the identifiers uh, associated with those. So we feel this is a really a good value-added sort of service that we're do, able to do simply because these identifiers exist and they have metadata associated with them. So that was case one. I think at this point I'm going to turn it to Jennifer. Okay, thanks everyone. Um, and so, um, as Greg mentioned, we have a multi-year initiative right now to instrument a research information management system for NCAR and UCAR. Um, and PIDs are, are integral to this uh, ambition, <laughs> um, especially because NSF and the other sponsors um, want quantifiable, quantifiable measures of the intellectual merit and broader impact of NCAR science. So these are very broad <laughs> um, concepts. And um, we, you know, we have um, a long history of collecting um, and doing, um, collecting publications and doing bibliometric analyses, as well as staying on top of our facility 
usage. Um, but really, it's th that has limited value. It, it certainly is valuable, um, but has limited value in terms of um, representing the, the work of the center as a whole and its impact. Um, and so again, as I mentioned, we have this um, initiative um, to define new metrics sort of beyond number of publications and time cited, <laughs> um, and to in instrument the system for um, our organization so that we can do um, some of the work that, you know, that Matt and Greg have been describing in a more integrated fashion. And so our, um, our aspired uh, RIM system builds on our practice of managing the citation record for NCAR peer-reviewed publications. Um, and we also have a custom database for um, staff activity reporting. We, um, as Matt mentioned, are um, long established now in assigning DOIs for outputs other than um, publications, uh, so for data sets and software as well as instruments and facilities. However, in spite of good um, uh, PID assignment, <laughs> um, we, we do have some current challenges in our system, so there's no common controlled vocabularies, and there just is a lot of customization and standaloneness um, to the way that we're doing um, research information management right now. Uh, and so one of our um, main goals for the RIM system implementation is to, um, to connect our systems. Um, so a good example, I think, and this is maybe getting a little bit in the weeds, but um, right now we um, manage associations between publications and grants and awards within the institutional repository, and we have a custom um, sort of, I'll call it setup, <laughs> to query the grants database and align that with publications, match that to publication metadata, and then we manage that relationship sort of behind the scenes in the, the repository. And with the new RIM system, we're hoping to um, sort of pivot and have a more uh, centralized location for managing relationships between things like grants and awards and, the, and their associated outputs, um, you know, not only publications, but then other products that stem um, from, from sponsored work. And so, um, you know, another, another ambition that we have here is to have more interoperability of our, in, of our um, system with the broader research analytics ecosystem. So, for example, right now we are um, dis um, we have orchids in our institutional repository, although they're not globally assigned to, um, to across publications. Rather, we have an internal identifier for our personnel, uh, and so this then cr it's very good for sort of our, you know our own purposes, <laughs> um, but it is, is difficult to integrate with the broader landscape when we're using this um, sort of you know, proprietary identifier for our publications. And so um, I'm like realizing, um, try and move along here. Um, so we are in the process of, um, we have an RFP out for a research information management system to, to build on our practices. And I'm trying to get the slide to advance. There we go. So um, this, these are draft graphics um, to be used in the promotion of our, of our work and try and get uptake. So there's maybe a lot of detail here, but the thing that um, I would um, point out is um, as I just mentioned, relationships between things like publications and, um, and associated data sets or publications and award numbers, that's happening um, internally to the um, Open Sky, our institutional repository platform. And then if we are asked questions about it, it takes people's, it takes, you know, specialized <laughs> people's time to, to answer questions. Um, and, you know, we, um, this, this really holds true for pretty much most questions that we get about the, um, the merit and the impact of our work. So we can easily answer questions, a number of citations, <laughs> uh, but once we go beyond that, it requires a lot of um, manual manipulation. And so again, as Greg was attesting to, a lot of time. <laughs> Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about our, um, our hoped for future state, which is where the, the RIM system will serve as a hub <laughs> for research metadata um, and a place that's where we sort of managed um, the relationships between um, the different PIDs, basically. So I was, I was like, the future state title for the slide should be, you know, PIDs make the dream work or something like that. <laughs> um, but, you know, when, we're ha when we have multiple author identifiers, this is not a very sort of, um, 
there, there are limitations there. And so one of the ways that we are imagining that, um, that PIDs will be useful to us is through um, broader uh, adoption of ORCID identifiers for our, own, um, for our own researchers, but also greater awareness about the ORCID identifiers that are associated with researchers using our facilities and platforms. And so, um, you know, maybe a good example here is for the usage of our supercomputer. Uh, currently, there, um, you know, people can gain access to um, supercomputing time, and the only way that we are able to find out what um, what came of that is to directly contact those people and ask them, did you create any publications? You know, what came of, um, of your time on the supercomputer? And so by leveraging the or ORCID authentication system, um, garnering ORCID identifiers for our HPC users, and then um, being able to assert back to those ORCID um, profiles usage of our facility, we're hoping to gain broader understanding of the usage of our facilities because it's you know, sort of going back to what I was saying before, and we have very good bibliometrics. I can answer all the bibliometrics questions the NSF might want to throw at us, but this is really insufficient for our time. And so, you know, what, what we would like to know is what is the uptake of our other products beyond peer-reviewed publications? What is the, what does usage of our facilities look like? And what are the downstream, um, you know, impacts of that? And so, again, identifiers are, um, are sort of key to this environment. Um, the last thing I would say is just referring back to that um, question of um, sort of What's the system of record for managing relationships? <laughs> so right now we have these relationships sort of tucked away in different systems, which is great because Matt and I know this, but Matt and I aren't forever, and so you know we need a sort of more central way of managing this information. Case in point would be our grants information. So we would like to have um, the associations between um, sponsored research and its um, various outputs, not, you know, peer-reviewed publications and the like um, managed centrally so that, you know, people other than um, sort of highly specialized individuals who are steeped in how these systems work are able to answer questions when we get them um, from, from our sponsors. And so I will turn it back over to Matt to sort of end this up with a final slide. Yes, this is the last slide. Uh, and these are, these are, in some sense, asterisks, right? So we've, we've talked a lot about the benefits of PIDs, and obviously we are uh, fully on board with that, but it, there are some very practical challenges. Uh, I've already said this at the top, PIDs alone do not provide much, much value. So, you know, I've worked with people to assign DOIs to things and they never put it on a web page, they never promote it, and not surprisingly it has zero citations, you know, 10 years down the road. So, assigning a PID itself is not, is not solving anything. Um, a couple points here, inconsistent use of PIDs is still very much a limiting factor to a lot of these services. Uh, that we're talking about, right? unpopulated ORCIDs, inconsistent data citations. Um, and to a certain extent, they, if you base metrics on these or some services on these, you can somehow get uh, you know, undercounts of things that seem like they're real counts that are, are actually deceiving. So uh, one example was we did a report for the NSF uh, a year or two ago on data, data citations specifically, so citations to our DOIs for data sets. And we were able to show from 2016 to 2020, it went from about 40 to over, four, over 400. And we were very excited, right? A tenfold increase in five years. This is a great thing. Uh, we, when we showed this to our organizational leadership, they said, 400 citations in a year is not very much. We're gonna take this chart out. <laughs> so they, they threw that chart in the garbage, even though we were very happy with it. Because to them, it, you know, for how, how many data sets we have, which is just over 10,000, uh, 400 citations in a year is not very much, right? So it, and it's true that that was not the actual number of uh, usage, right? So that was, a, it was a, an indicator of DOI usage, not of data set usage. Um, I mentioned external services like uh, Scopus, Dimensions. Uh, these are good, they're getting better. They're much better than they were five to 10 years ago. They're still inconsistent, they're still incomplete, uh, and so somewhat hard to, to use to, to do these things. And then the last point is the PIDs require man management and maintenance. You need to keep your DOIs pointing to the right place, uh, ORCIDs, uh, people's names change, things like that. So. Um, there are a lot of things to still work out, but we're uh, hoping we can get a lot more progress in the next five years as we have in the previous five. So stop there and take questions.
Is it on? Oh, thanks. So uh, Matt and I were involved in a project where we talked about curation thresholds being a great time to try and gather this kind of information. I'm submitting a proposal, writing a paper, doing my annual report for NSF, uh, things like that. What I find interesting about what you're doing is libraries, research, administration, and enterprise systems are coming together. So I'm going to paint a scenario, and you tell me if it's desirable, undesirable, or something in between. I'm a new employee at NCAR. And when I'm in Workday and I'm doing my payroll information, you, e you either require me to create an ORCID or you capture it. That is the dream. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I mean, that's not quite true. I, I mean, look, we're moving to a world where we really need to know who people are. I mean, and if you look at some of the external factors like NSF's requirements on foreign collaborations right now, it's really critical that we know who we're collaborating with. And going back to the, the previous talk about the use of GitHub, like if you don't ever look and see who your collaborators are in GitHub because you're not gonna recognize two thirds of them and it will terrify you, right? So, so that's very, uh, a scary thing. The more we can drive people to verifiable identities, the better off we are. The, the less we have to sort of manage those identities internally, the better off we are. So this has a lot of sort of downstream value that doesn't really have anything even to do with research, but more like a research administration, research compliance. So like I have a lot of uh, reasons for really wanting to do this, but federated identities, and this is a type of federated identity essentially, like to me this is the way to go in terms of keeping us compliant with all the NSF stuff that's coming in the next 10 years. It's just gonna get worse and worse. So yeah, I would love it if people came in, got an ORCID, Frankly, I would love it if they authenticated to all my systems via their ORCID rather than me assigning internal usernames and, and email addresses, right? So there's a lot of things here that could take so much work off the sort of enterprise side and give research benefits and research compliance benefits. So yes, I agree with that direction. I don't know that we'll get there anytime soon, but totally agree with the direction. Uh, Tom Morell, Caltech. I was really excited um, to see your kind of enhancement of data sets and software links via PDF scraping. So I was curious kind of what percentage of the publications in your repository were you able to enhance in that way? And is any of that code open source? Uh, so to answer your second question first, it should be. <laughs> I need to talk to my colleague who's written the code. He's, I know he would be very happy to share it. So. Um, you know, whether it's in an open source repository now, we, we, we should make it so. Um, in terms of how, how many, uh, I, I don't have the most recent numbers, but I want to say that, again, this is a one that's kind of gradually increased over the years. We started looking, I think we went back to 2020, because we instituted this in 2021, I think. Um, I think it was around 15% at that point, and I think it's more around 30% now. So it, it's, it, it's been fairly stable around 25 to 30% for the past couple of years. Very cool, thanks. Yeah. Mark Loverswiler, University of Oklahoma Libraries. I'm also gonna say that I'm a ringer. I'm a meteorologist by training before we move into the libraries. <laughs> I was also a member of UserCom from Unidata. And so the question I have <clears throat> is, is related to the software end of things. And so I know working with that at the time, it was not just people within the atmospheric science community. So the local data manager software package for moving data packets is used by a lot of commodity commercial type companies where <clears throat> reporting for them is not going to be in the same interest or vein for us within the science, science environment. So how do you work with programs like Unidata, which are code developers, or say your radar group, which comes out with Solo, right, which is the standard, and we're dealing with issues of reproducibility. That's also coming up, and people don't necessarily track what version of the software they've been using for their, their stuff. I'm seeing it as a culture change within faculty and researchers outside of your organization. So how do you address that? You have these needs internally, and I agree with everything you're saying and everything, all the problems, but also all the advantages. How do you get that culture change for the users that are not within your ecosystem of NCAR, UCAR, when you're dealing with the academic institutions, all the field programs that come up, and then the private industry that's making use of your software as well? I, I, I'll, I'll, solve I, all the world's problems. I, yeah, I can, we, got, we got five minutes you go, here. You go first, I, I can respond first. So first I'll say that most of the Unidata software that you're referring to has DOIs at this point. 
Um, now, it's a great point, though, that many of the users wouldn't be writing papers with the, the software, so you wouldn't sort of track it that way. And so I think we see the, the sort of DOI-based citation type counts uh, as a complementary to other types of usage counts to get kind of get that aspect of it. Um, in terms of the culture change, I think we're also, we've, we've done a lot of engagement with the American Meteorological Society in particular, which, you know, of course, is very relevant to our community. Um, so I was on a panel that wrote a data citation recommendation um, in 2015, uh, and they, more recently, there's a, a similar statement on so software citation and archiving, and I know that the AMS publication side, so again, publication-focused, has changed some of their art, uh, author guidelines in the recent years to have data availability statements, software availability statements. So I think the culture part is a community thing, and so I think we really like to sort of work with the publishers, a AMS and the AGU, which is the American Geophysical Union, to kind of be the more visible right entity in that since they cross cut more groups. If you want to comment. Yeah, I just I'll just add real quickly, and this is going to sound kind of way out there, but you know when you look around an organization, you see like forty units, whatever those units are. You know, when you look at the researchers, if you've got fourteen hundred researchers, that's fourteen hundred more units. So each of them it has their own set of processes, their own background, their own interests, their own visions, their own goals, their own mission, everything. And so when you look at that culture change, you cannot get 40 units to adopt a common process. You're never going to get 1,400 faculty to adopt a common process. Thinking that you ever will is, just, is beyond a dream. It's just silliness, right? So what you have to do is you've got to come up with things that are close enough to the most common workflow you can think of that it will allow the most number of faculty possible to use it well. And you can't aim for 100% of them because you're never going to hit them, but you can try to get like as much as you can. And that's really the best you can do because they are going to keep having their own individual. I mean, that's what they're there for is to have individual missions and goals. So you can't put an end to that or you've killed the research. Short. Um, I'm Megan Sensony. I'm at the University of Arizona. Um, I've been working with members in our research office to try to socialize ORCID adoption. Um, and I was looking at your uh, kind of blue sky, that might be a pun here, list of um, integrations for products and systems, and, and then hearing your very pragmatic answer just now. And I'm curious, you know, if you were to look at that list and talk about what you would prioritize in terms of potential for highest impact, in terms of moving forward specific integration efforts first. Um, I feel like locally we've done a lot of low-hanging fruit pragmatic approaches to like what would be the easiest to integrate, but I, I would just be curious to hear your thoughts on, on if you were to prioritize some of those items by impact, what, what you might prioritize. My quick answer would be the institutional repository and the research administration system, your grant system, like yeah. to me, uh, and your research information management system. So if I get three, those are my three. So. And I'll just add that the first um, kind of integration that we're working on within Greg's unit is the Workday, which is the HR system. And so what we kind of want to establish there is what's the system of record to track ORCIDs? You know, we have a system of record for publications and for grants, uh, but if we sort of decide that Workday is that, and then we can kind of build other things from there. So that's where we're starting. That's super helpful, thank you. And I think, if I might add, that if we could have another <laughs> thing on our short list of priorities for the, for the ORCID authentication mechanism. Um, so we're sort of, you know, considering that it, it, it's, part of our, um, it's part of our initiative to, um, you know, sort of get broad adoption of ORCID identifiers themselves. Um, but that use case that I mentioned about the supercomputer facility and being able to authenticate people rather, I mean, we're creating local username and password. For, okay. um, and so we really want to do that in a best practices way um, and one that also allows us to, um, to, to feed back to um, ORCID profiles, the usage of our um, of our facility, mm -hmm. so that that is you know that so that's established for the researchers themselves, but then also for our organization when we go to answer questions about our impact. Um, so yeah, yeah. Thank, and just to add on that, like just imagine a world where we could by ORCID we could call out how much CPU time, how much data, I mean how much storage, etc., on an ORCID by ORCID basis for the super, like that would just be brilliant, and we're just nowhere near that right now. I think we're getting into the break, but let's do one more question, then we'll be done. 
This might not be an easy question for uh, you know 30 seconds. Um, I understand why you've uh, approached using DOIs for research infrastructure, like high performance computing and airplanes and things. Um, but it's really a misapplication of DOI, and I'm sort of troubled by that because you're kind of pigeonholing something into something that it's not designed for. Um, the question that I have, though, is what are gaps in the persistent identifier landscape that you're facing uh, that we need to develop new PIDs for, like software for research infrastructure, that instead of turning to DOI to solve every problem, I mean, we could use the handle system, but let's think beyond the box. Yeah, so I'll comment on that first. I mean, I, to a certain extent, anything beyond publications is a misapplication of the DOI system. I mean, <laughs> you know, when we first started looking at data sets, it's kind of a goofy idea, right? They change a lot. If you have regularly, uh, added, reg regularly growing data sets, right, the DOI thing kind of breaks down a little bit. Uh, you, you get the same data sets in multiple systems quite frequently. So I, I think any use beyond you know, very stable objects, it, it's, it's, it's not a perfect fit. Um, but the reason we're using them for that purpose was because we had some of the same goals as we had for data citation, which is, can we see who's using these things? Can we track who's using these things? We've had a really difficult time in doing that. Um, and can we find a mechanism to try to do that? Uh, so that's why we're using DOIs. I, I agree it's a strange fit. Um, but uh, again, I think that's true for a lot of other resources. Um, and what we're trying to do with this grant that I mentioned is to build use cases for different kind of identifier schemes that we're looking at research resource IDs also in that context, which were more created for that purpose, uh, as well as other identifier schemes to say, say, you know, we have use cases for citing uh, facilities and identifying them, and we have identifier schemes and their capabilities. How do the use cases and the identifier schemes match up? So that's, that is one of the goals of our, this project that I mentioned is to try to get to, um, uh, you know, is the DOI the right thing to use for these? If not, what's a different and better scheme, uh, identifier scheme to do that? And like very specifically, like if you had a database of your institutional research assets, every column in that database, that's what we need PIDs for. So that, that's really the short answer. Like if you can imagine every possible research asset, we need to be able to identify all of them. In terms of your second question, um, uh, or your whatever, the other question around what PIDs do we need more, I, I would kind of almost push in the opposite direction that I think we need less, I, we need fewer new PIDs at this point and greater connections between the existing PIDs. And you know, to your point, figuring out which PIDs are really good for which purposes. I th there, there were so many PID systems that have been started up, and I think we haven't connected them and really figured out how they work well together. So that I would be hesitant to promote any new ones at this point until that's been sussed out a bit more. And I would add on, in, in sort of in, in defense of our approach, um, we, we began doing this work almost 12 years ago, I think. and. Um, you know, the, we initially assigned an ARC to the, um, to the supercomputer at the time and um, with the next generation moved toward DOI because DOI had, what am I going to call it, like brand recognition, <laughs> the tra um, traction with our researchers. And so in order to um, encourage an assignment of these persistent identifiers and mm -hmm. encourage citation of persistent identifiers, DOI was really sort of an obvious inroad in our community to, um, to sort of say they already had established understanding of why you know, DOIs worked, we'll say. And so it was, a, it was an entry um, for us as we you know, got into this space, although now you know, understanding that maybe there were some, you know, we had, there's some finesse required. <laughs> but I think this is a great point of what I was trying to say before, which is the use case was citation, right? And so DOI was very visible in that context. Whereas in the institutional repository, as I mentioned, when we use ARCs, I mean, we, you know, we want people to cite those, but that's the use case is more for persistent location. And so we're not concerned about metadata, we're not concerned about citation aggregation as much. And so the ARC is perfectly fine for that. So I think it, that the point about use cases and identifier schemes and how they match up is really important here. All right, we should stop there. Thank you everybody, I really appreciate your questions.